Now, say my name. The Rolling Bad Podcast. You're goddamn right. Coming to you almost live from the city of Provis, it's the Rolling Bad Podcast, episode number 162, because I put a P instead of an O, <laughs> so maybe it is 62. It is June 16th, and I'm your host, Bill Costello. With me is Joshua Alt, working from dawn to dusk this last few weeks. I know. <laughs> mm. Bill gets sick. I get <sighs> sick and tired of work. Yeah. But uh, hey, we somehow made it together on dad's day happy father's, father's day. day to yes. all the fathers out there thanks for listening in hope you're having a or hope you had yes a great and wonderful father's day with your children damn straight damn straight on a side note because um the reason we haven't been recording is i got covid and when i got covid like five days later my wife got covid and so as i was starting to heal from covid she was beginning her trek through the morass that is and, of course, I picked up a second case. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to play a little ping pong when you, yeah. when your partner has COVID. Yep. And now she's dealing with that very end also, which truly sucks. But uh, we seem to be over it. I have most of my voice back. so. Um, but on that note, I am going to turn off the page. I didn't get a chance to do it for June because I'm an idiot and I was too late. But I will turn off the Patreon charging for July so that it kind of evens out a little bit. Um, I also want to welcome all the new Patreons. Thank you guys so much for, for signing up. Every little bit helps, and we do appreciate it. And now you're welcome to After Dark, folks. Yes, you are. Oh, yeah. 100% more swear words. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in gaming news around the world, um, Atomic Mass Games announced that uh, development is ceasing on X-Wing and Armada. It's kind of just a matter of time for those two games, but it's kind of sad to see. <laughs> you know, it's just obviously the games will be playable forever because the models are there, the rules are there. They're in a reasonably decent rules place, I think. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't keep up with the community enough, but yep, those those days are gone. Are they refocusing on the uh, the newer Star Wars game? Is it's, their primary. It's coming down to Legion, Shatterpoint, and uh, MCP for those guys. I mean. Those are all good games. So <laughs> it's, you know, Legion continues to have a small but rabid contingent, which is, you know, the sales are good. So I evidently, but I have to imagine that the X Wing and Armada sales just probably weren't enough for Osmodee to justify continued work. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I could see that, particularly with, with Shatterpoint coming out and you have like all your favorite characters and not just the, uh, the ships. You know, yeah. it's sort of like, uh, oh God, what was it? Battlefleet Gothic or whatever it was yeah. for yeah. for 40K. Yep. Like, you still have some rabid fans for that stuff. But oh, yeah. generally speaking, the folks aren't playing it. Right. So all I can say is rest in peace. And then the other huge news, which, li I, I mean, my mouth literally dropped when I heard this. Uh, Steamforged Games has purchased the entirety of War Machine and the Iron Kingdom's as well as P3 Paints and all of the ancillary stuff from Privateer Press. Huh. And I would have to imagine that within the next month or two, we're going to see Privateer Press fold as a company because uh -huh, uh -huh. he literally sold the only property. I mean, they have Monster Apocalypse and a couple of other things, but I don't see them surviving that much longer. I, I think he's just done with it. All I can say is thank you, Gaming Gods, because... <laughs> Steamforge will hopefully breathe some new life into it. Really, all they have to do is roll back an edition uh -huh, uh -huh. and make the game great again. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay, anyway. Uh, 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 phrasing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, great news for great news for War Machine and Hordes. I'm, I'm now maybe not so sad that I have boxes and boxes and boxes of War Machine armies <laughs> that maybe... We'll see the light of day. Uh, hey, if it picks up, Bill, you know, show me how to play. Might get into that. I like these little offshoot games that aren't like you know mainstream right now. War Machine and Hordes are such great games with such innovative mechanics and a great rich history. And really, I have to say that the third edition of that game, the one done by Pagani and Schick from 
uh, Atomic Mass Games was probably, I mean, Ulf said the same thing. It was probably the best miniatures rule set ever made. Oh, wow. It was it was clear, concise. You knew what your stuff did. You did what it said. And you fought. You have to like that style of game. But it was it's a lot of fun. Uh-huh, it's uh-huh. a ton of fun. So hopeful for the future. So for releases for our neck of the woods, <laughs> hey, book six for Dawnbringers came out. And I don't know why. <laughs> no, actually, you know, it's another one of those Dawnbringer books yeah. where it's the end of an edition. Mm-hmm. Don't expect groundbreaking, oh, my God, you know, these new rules are amazing. No. no. These new rules are along for less than a month. Yes. So, <laughs> however, it does do a lot of stage setting. Lore-wise, it's... When we get to covering the book, you, I'll give my real thoughts there. But it seems to me like they took all the ideas that were pushed off and not published in White Dwarf and uh-huh, not uh-huh. put out anywhere else. They just gathered them together, put them in this book, and said, just have a little bit of fun at the end of the game. Yeah, they're like, we really end wanted like, almost like just put a punctuation mark on some sentences because the real stuff's actually coming. Right. And, you know, let's be real here, folks. We got less than a month. So, um other new thing is the uh, Conquest Lore Campaign Pack, Crucible of Wills. Oh, my God, is that good? Right. Um, just this amazing, it's your faction locked. It's Dweg versus Hundred Kingdoms. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> well, it's okay. I mean, it's I like it. But two <laughs> characters, one for Dweg, one for Hundred K, and they are cool as hell. They are individually named. They have their own cards. Yep, yep. But you can use them in a normal game. Some of their narrative rules won't apply, but that's fine. They 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 count as. So just another great opportunity to paint something up. But the Crucible of Will storyline, along with the scenarios that go into it, yep. and the regiments of renown that are so cool. Oh, man. It's just they they continue to knock stuff out of the park. It's something Parabellum likes to do. Yeah. Without saying they're doing it. It just happens and yep. we all get enjoy it. Yep. And as you so eloquently said, nothing in New Dawn matters anymore because July thirteenth seems like a consensus date and <laughs> we will be able to order <clears throat> order AOS four point Oh, well that'll be the twenty ninth of June, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. June like July thirteenth is the actual launch date. Is launch <laughs> is it the launch or the pre order date? Pre order date I think is uh twenty ninth. Okay. All right. Yeah. In that case, I'll be happy. Yeah. Well, okay, no. Scratch that. I'm I almost said I almost dropped an F bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I am super happy. Yeah. Cuz AOS 4.0. Yeah. And coolness. And when we get into the lore section, we're going to cover some of the highlights of the faction focuses that we've seen <laughs> so far that are so freaking cool. <laughs> oh my god, this is going to be great times ahead. Yeah, there will be some lulls in the faction focus though. Um, I'm looking at you, Slanesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. You had your run, and it was in first edition, so shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, end of second, they were like, all right. Well, when their book launched in second, and it was yeah. beautiful, and then they had to scale them back so much because they were too good, and then 3.0, they were the biggest NPE in the freaking game. Yes. Right, I'm going to do this. Would you like a dice? Dude, stop. <laughs> yeah, will you just click the sh- yeah yeah so that's that that's gone all right so creativities um i've actually done a lot of stuff you know covid has that weird (laughs) effect of i there was days there that i was not um the mental state was not i was not capable of going to work because of the fogginess Mm -hmm. and you know i cannot make decisions that affect people and money when i'm that way yeah so, no, I did not go to work, but I literally did sit in here and, you know, I, I built the entire Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the core box for the new mm-hmm. MCP. I got it all built and primed, started painting some of the models. Um, I got Magic and Colossus from my backlog done because I'm, I'm looking to run a couple of different lists. I, I'm, cool. I want to get away from this that shield slash Avengers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are you just a movie guy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically. <laughs> you know. I never read a comic in my life. 
<laughs> oh, there's actually printed books that that have these characters in them. Oh wow! I Allegedly, know I've I've seen memes on Facebook with the characters in it. So. Yeah, I thought it was just people doing different kinds of art. Okay, uh, that's weird. That's All weird. Right. I'll have to check that out <laughs> as I look at my Marvel Unlimited <laughs> subscription <laughs> going. Oh, thank God for that. Yeah, oh, man. Right. It is such a you know if you are into comic books. Really seriously look into the Marvel Unlimited subscription mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you get access to every comic ever from Marvel, of course. And when you're looking up stuff and you're like, I need to figure out when. Uh, the other day I was going down that rabbit hole, hole of cable and I was like, was there a point in time where Old Man Cable was around with Teenage Cable in the Earth 616 thing? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had to, I had to do, I dig quite a bit to find out that they existed at the same time for like a period of five years. Oh. And the kid did not know that the older guy was him. And, you know, it's just kind of funny how Cable gets the inorganic virus. Yeah. Um, he gives it to Apocalypse, who then gives it to younger Cable, which is the reason that older Cable has it. So he infected himself, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, oh, my God, poor dude. Oh, uh, to quote Futurama, Mr. I'm my own grandpa. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so, so messed up. Uh, I love that story. Anyway, um, moving on. For Conquest, I um, I built 2,000 points worth of uh, 100 kingdoms. Yeah. Okay. That's it? Uh, okay. Yeah, just, you know, whatever. whatever. Really, it's such a cheater thing to say because to build 2,000 points – uh, or a thousand points of hundred kingdoms. You just buy one box and yes. you put together like ten horses. And bam, <laughs> there's there's a thousand points. We got there. Yeah, we're there. Woohoo! One of the broken things in that campaign, that lore campaign, mm -hmm. is there's a side rule that says he can ignore the limit, mm -hmm. the four regiment limit in a war band. <laughs> And uh, both sides can do it, and yeah. it's it's in order to get you into the game, just playing the main the named characters. Yeah. Um. So if you don't have a fully established army, you don't have to buy everything. You can just buy a couple boxes and you're in. Yeah. But uh, I can just see how broken that could be. <laughs> Luckily, he doesn't have access to the big cavalry units. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I'm like, I can have six units of steel legion. Oh, no, they limited it to one or two. <laughs> two. Oh, I love it. And in those, in those groups where you're unlimited. Mm-hmm. Um, you're still limited to four stands per, so you can't make 12 blocks of steel. Oh and, you know, 12 blocks of Merc, bow, Merc crossbowmen. So no, <laughs> none of that stuff. I'm just not even putting my models on the table. If you do that, <laughs> it's not even, that's not right. I so. control this half of the board yeah. <laughs> from this one location and I'm not visible. Tonight. Right. Yeah. I'm in the Jeez. woods. You can't shoot me. I can shoot you. Forget your life. So <laughs> anyway, moving on from that, um, I did pick up the chariots for city states. The two chariots are just so bonkers good. Um, did a lot of painting actually. Mm -hmm. Got the bow chosen done. Got the trolls pretty much finished up. A lot of MCP stuff. Um, I sort of glossed over the fact that my three D printer died. Um, bro, yeah, it's uh the bed leveler the. Uh, it's it's uh, called a BL Touch. It's just this little device that levels the bed so that the prints come out correctly. Yeah. It died. And because it fails its self-test, it doesn't let the printer come online to print. Mm. So I have to replace that. And But I ended up buying a new bamboo uh, P1P. Okay. I know I should have bought the P1S, but I'm upgrading it to a P1S, so stop. Um, and I'm just amazed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed at... How much faster it is. Prints that took three hours on the Ender 5 are done in maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Whoa. On the new one. Yeah, it it, it will actually accelerate to 20,000 feet per minute. <sighs> so when this thing starts printing, I had it on this table, and huh. this table has, you know, the top of this table comes off so that I can play games underneath. Yeah. And it was rocking so hard. I thought it was going to fall. Oh my I God. Thought it was going to fall off the pegs. So I was like, okay, I have to get this a special mount. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did. So yeah, it's a, it's an amazing printer, but I started printing out or designing 
and printing movement trays for Conquest. Look at that. That are so flipping handy. When Terry got over here and I started handing him movement trays for his guys, he was like, oh, my God, these things are awesome. Right. <laughs> so I will be putting the STL up on the Discord. So if you're into Conquest and you need movement trays, um, it'll be a few days because right now the actual files that I have are only for stands of two and stands of three. I have to do the one for stand of four and then... You know, two by two, two by three, two by four. Yeah. All those things so that it just makes life easy. Um, but I will be putting those up on the Discord. So they're very cool. They work well. So what have you gotten? <laughs> I'll tell you what, folks. Uh, Bill gets sick and he inverts the creation <laughs> section of the uh, the show. <laughs> I uh, Like I said, I've been working like dawn to dusk because um, I've got multiple homicides and, and all this stuff coming up in june and july so Jeez. i uh been grinding um so what i was able to do though um i didn't finish them yet but i built a unit of gin and i started my second unit of ifrit Oof. um how i'm doing the the gin and the ifrit so i'll have like one melee version one ranged yep. version yep. you know and that's all for testing purposes sure right and 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 the great thing about um conquest you know like as long as i don't have too much of a difference i can say it counts as and it's not a oh, big deal at all proxying is so i mean we do it all the time all the time all the time i mean you had to when you had units that didn't even have models out for them you know so you just had to you had to proxy a lot of stuff i mean now they're dropping like the cultists and the hashashans yeah. and so you're able to like round out what actually is in uh old dom and yeah um finally getting the chariot models they're gorgeous oh, um so <laughs> The, uh, the Talos, though, dude. Oh, oh, dude. Give me two of that guy. Oh, my Lord. When they dropped that, I was like, why does city-states get all the cool tall guys? What's going on here? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, the ta currently the city-states have the Promethean and the Hephaestus. Obviously, a melee beater and a spell beater or a fire beater. Mm. And they kind of lacked a unifying piece mm -hmm. for their big honking monsters. And the Talos comes along and he's like, hey, I'm the boss. Yeah. Okay, y'all work for me. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Such a great model. And I think it will round out what City States really needs to be actually majorly competitive. And, you know, I, we always talk about the competitiveness of Conquest. And I always want to put that caveat out there that, we're talking about a 49% win rate versus a 50%. And that's what concerns Parabellum. Yeah. Is when somebody drops below that 48, 49% ability to take a game, they consider it broken. They don't do this 10% window that, mm. you know, obviously GW has 18 factions to balance. They have eight. Yeah. So I'm not dogging GW on this. I'm just saying it for them, it's the vast gulf of difference between, say, city states and Dweg isn't that vast <laughs> it's no you know. no not at all um that's what's the my favorite part about content we can talk about that at nauseum right but like they work so hard to keep balancing things like and it's constant fine-tuning constant fine-tuning you know and all these updates it's on the website it's yep. all free you know and so because they're that concerned with making sure that the game stays that enjoyable yeah you're not playing a faction that's in the trash bin <laughs> We had a little after darkism. Yeah, I have to darked a little bit. I'll go wipe it off. Um, but yeah, uh, and that's that's really a thing with you know uh, Sorcerer Kings being their infancy. They did get a lot of models dropped at launch. Yep. Um, but in my opinion, one of the most important units hasn't dropped yet, which is the Archers. Yeah. Because um, they're your medium objective score that you can yes. attach. You know, really good sorcerers or you know. Uh, arranged maharaja to so that way you can you know do what you need to do i mean like the they it's a solid archer unit you know um for what it does sure but being able to throw any of the heroes on that archer unit and be able to backfield them instead of having to march them up like, attached to raja core yeah is it's is great um so yeah but i i haven't finished the ifrit yet um so it's just again my second unit of ifrit and that was uh that was my creation i can tell y'all come July thirteenth. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, there might uh, be a little. <laughs> there might be a little bit. I uh, I might uh, lock myself in my room until I have the entire half of the Skaven built and primed, and then honing uh, my uh, 
my paint scheme for them. Yep. I uh, had to put the pause button on my pestilence because I just don't know what they're going to do right now. And honestly, it, it, you know, we've got the sort of Damocles right now. It, yeah. It's you don't you don't want to start any real big project because I want to see. Yeah. I want to look at it first. So I am. Yeah, I haven't I haven't touched anything for AOS. I can I can pretty much guarantee I will be dusting off the maggot can um, for sure. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that'll <laughs> glow up. Yeah, we'll talk about that in the faction focus section. Yeah. Um, and so to kind of save on time, I also did not play any games. I have played some, you know, video games here and there. Um, after you know, talking with Ulf last <laughs> time, I, I can't, I can't find Far Cry Five yet. I might try and swing by some of the local Game Stops today and see if I can get an old PS4 copy because it's like sixty dollars on the PS wow. Network, PlayStation Damn. Network. Like, nope. Um, but I did start playing Far Cry Six, which, oh, nice. you know, it's not going up against a crazy cult in Montana, but. Um, it is going up against a uh, like a warlord in the Caribbean, so nice. um, it's pretty cool. Um, I, I have not played a like a Far Cry game, like I said. I played the first one. Um, getting back to that's been fun, but that's been my battle, so to speak, more in After Dark. Cool, cool. As far as my battling goes, it's obviously haven't played AOS again. Sort of Damocles. Why? Yep. Why play? But um, did play two. Big conquest games. Took out my hundred kingdoms for the first time against the Dweg. Crazy, crazy game. It was one of those deals where I did reinforcement rolls so badly that my army wasn't really even on the most of the bulk of my army wasn't on the table until turn four. Oof. And yeah, Oof. he was scoring points like crazy by that time because I couldn't. I did one thing. I set up my you know, my theist priest with my militia. I shot them forward as quick as I could just to slow them up, just to bottleneck them a little bit, knowing that they were going to get completely raffle stomped. But and they did. But they held them up a turn so that I could get the cavalry to start forming up. And oh, it was. I would say turns four, five, and six were some of the bloodiest turns I've ever seen. We were just pulling units. Uh, it was it was gross. It was awesome. It was the kind <laughs> of it was turns that you look forward to because yeah. it was it wasn't lopsided. It was just it was brutal and mm -hmm. it was two armies smashing into each other. So much fun. But I managed to keep more scoring units alive because um, by the by turn eight he had one scoring unit. And if he left the objectives, he was going to just not score with them. So he could have come around and tried to kill me, but there was no point in it. So math-wise, we called it on turn eight. But up until that point, I had been behind in points the whole game. It's crazy. How'd the horses work out for you? Oh, my God. They are <laughs> bonkers good. Except, you know, the beauty of this game is they get, their, they get their hit in, they get their impact, they get their clash. They can delete a unit. And then they will get they will get engaged by something on the enemy side mm -hmm. and bogged down and killed. And yeah. it's nothing in this game is so even the Ash and Dawn. You know they they went in and they charge clashed two units to death on consecutive turns. And then the Dragon Hunters got a hold of them and said, "No, you're dead. Yeah, you you are flipping dead, you stupid horsey boys." And he did. He just killed them off. Okay, I mean you stifle. A charge on cavalry, or you engage them before they can oh, charge, and that's you, that's that's what you have to do to stop you them. Neuter them. them, yeah, yeah. They will. They they live for the the charge impact clash, right? Like that's that's how they're able to to clear everything. I mean, sure. sort of like I don't know, cavalry does. Yeah, um, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> so if you if you get that that charge off on them to stifle it, I mean, it's it's a slog. Yep. Um, they have to try and cut through or reform or something to try and get away from it and it's usually not going to work out for him once that happens so not not at all so yeah i could see why those dragon hunters came in they're like we're stopping this right now yeah and it's he has like an eight brick of dragon hunters so it's oh, god it's not like they just oh i'll i'll, I'll shoot ping them to death no no they <laughs> just are a presence on the board and i avoid them <laughs> uh little death story right there. yeah it's it's amazing it's awesome and you know <laughs> you have to literally charge into the side of them or the rear to do real damage to them um 
But it's fun because they do die. Mm-hmm. You know, they will go away. Yeah. It's just you have to prepare yourself to chew through them, and it's mm-hmm. hard. Yeah, yeah. So, and sometimes it makes more sense to ignore them. Another game played Nords versus Dweg a couple of weeks before that one. Um, that game was just a really, we were doing random scenarios, and we should have probably looked at it at the outset and said, this isn't good because the way the objectives were set up, the Dweg were never going to get to them. Um, I was playing Nords, so I was able to put all my fast units in front of him as screens, bottlenecked him up into his deployment zone, and just I sat there and scored all the all the objective zones. And, you know, it was a it was a bad, it was a silly game. Shouldn't have done it. What was the deployment on it? Was it was it long ways or short ways? It was long ways. Oh, okay. It was regular long ways deployment, and it was just, but I'm so fast yeah. with my flankers. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. you know, on turn one, I had six out of my 11 units on the board oh. and that included no turn two i had seven of 11 units with all my mediums so all my scoring guys were on the board and after that it was just a question of just racking up points until he destroyed my stuff but time wise he didn't have enough time to equal my my point lead so what's the dweg move for uh, is their four standard base is like five oh, okay they have the like the dragon guys go think five yeah so but they're not i mean they're just bulky armored little dwarves they're they play like dwarves and they have these amazing shields and they almost all of them have iron discipline so even when you hit them from the side they get to use their shields Mm -hmm. so yeah they're just they're just that's what they do they castle up and let you break on the wall of dwarfisms or you can play the dweg gun line and just shoot everything to death which those stupid sorcerers. Oh, anyway, um, <laughs> the Dweg sorcerers break the rule of the game. Their special rule is they can cast two spells per turn. Yep. And every time they cast successfully, they get a little cheater marker that says, I use this marker to automatically pass something, uh-huh. either hit, wound, or uh, resolve test. And it's just, you know, you're looking at this stack of, <laughs> here's my free hits. Or here's my free saves. Mm-hmm. And you're like, God, I hate you. Uh, fun times. Fun times. Oh, yeah. And then played a bunch of MCP. Um, played ah, one, two, four TTS games. A um, couple of them I don't remember because it was in the middle of COVID. I hope the person I played had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember it well enough. But then played some actual on the table games with my defender list which needs a lot of work because I won two, lost two, didn't make the cut. So, oh, well. Ho-hum. But Silver Sable is coming out. Um, I checked to make sure that my chrome paint is still good. So (laughs) when Silver Sable gets here, buddy, (laughs) it's a different story. Yeah. Oh, Have you seen? I haven't seen her. I haven't seen the card. She's amazeballs. So all of her stuff is range five. She's, of course, an assassin. She's, you know, going to... Her basic, uh, her basic attack is a builder, mm-hmm. uh, range five. I think it's five dice with a wild stun. I believe it is wild stun on a so, builder. Yeah, huh. yeah. And then her spender is a range five. I think it's six or seven dice, um, like four cost, mm-hmm. and it has wild stagger or st- it has one of the. It's yeah. really good. Um, but it also has a, uh, I think, wild uh, wild crit trigger for move the enemy short towards you. <laughs> so displacement. And then the rest of her kit is all about her just being amazingly difficult to nail down. Uh-huh. And she's really bright. And she can also offer dice to other people. She pays two power. Or when a, when a friendly unit attacks, they can pay two power. One goes to her. And they get plus one dice on their attack. So she's basically being the mercenary that she is. Huh. And she's enabling them to hit with one more die. It's kind of cute. It's I don't see it being a game changer. But in sometimes, like if you have flurry or rapid fire, that's going to be huge. Wow. So it's it's the activate, the <laughs> character that's being activated spends two power. She gets a power. She gets a power. And gives them a dice. And gives them a die. Dude, that's strong. That's strong. Yeah. That's real. What's the range on it? A four. It's a range four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she's a. Uh, what team is she with? Uh, well, she's so so she's gonna be defenders. We know okay. that. 
Um, other than that, I don't know what affiliations they're going to put her with. Huh. So she's actually such a mercenary. I would have thought that they would have made her a rogue agent, but no. she'd be too strong as a rogue agent to be anywhere. Could you imagine? Yeah, she'd be too much. But her <laughs> best, the best part of her kit is she has three, three, three defenses, which is lame in yeah. this day and age. However, if she is on a piece of terrain, size three or greater, and you are not on the same piece of terrain, she can add two dice, two defense dice to physical and energy attacks. <laughs> so she's actually five, five, three. If you spend turn one, getting her on top of a building or something. Yeah. And why wouldn't you with In, a range five? Yeah. <laughs> range five on top of a building. So now I'm at five defense dice. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I love her. <laughs> I haven't even met her, and I love her. So, <laughs> all right, let's take a quick break, and we'll jump into our tri-tip lore section, which we're going to cover some hobby tips because, hey, we're getting a new box for AOS shortly, so we'll cover briefly some hobby tips. Then we'll cover book six a little bit, and we'll look at the faction previews for the our favorite AOS factions. All right, let's do it. All right. And now for something completely different. Okay, here comes the lore coming at you. And we're going to do like three brief topics because, you know, there's not a whole lot of stuff. But in order to get you ready and make you think about the new box that's coming up in a few weeks, um, yes, AOS 4 is real. It's not just a hashtag anymore. No. So um, we're going to cover some quick hobby tips and ideas Nothing, nothing major, nothing you haven't heard before, most likely. But, hey, if you're new and you get something out of this, even better. Or if you are uh, been in the hobby for a while and you're remi- reminded, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, true. So, first up, this is personally for me. Uh-huh. Um, take your Exactos and throw them away. Um, they suck. Exacto used to be, like, the most awesome knives you could possibly get and that blades lasted forever and they were great. And then they cheaped out, like, yeah, okay. And um, now they're just crap. Now it's just like Craftsman, you know, used to be the top of the line. Now it's junk. So you can go online, Amazon. No, I don't have an affiliate link. And just look for scalpel and scalpel blades. Mm -hmm. You will find holders and you will find blades. Yep. Amazingly cheap, amazingly sharp. They're designed to cut skin. They are designed for surgeons. Yes. Okay. But they are super cheap. The Corollary to that is you're going to change blades often. So probably pick up one of those blade containers so that you don't hurt yourself and your dogs and your kids throwing them away. But you will be so much happier with a super sharp blade. Uh, Be very careful the first few times you use them because they are like five times sharper than an X-Acto. Ah, yeah. I mean, that's what they're used for. Yeah, and you'll hurt yourself. Hey, if you're going to go Dexter on some criminals in your community too, they have dual use, so... Right, uh, and you sure. can buy two packs. Yeah. So one for hobby, one for other hobby. hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Categorically avoid GW tools. Overpriced and ineffective. They're not good. <laughs> the mold line remover is about the best thing they have, and it is really quite good. The new yeah. one is awesome. Everything else is. They're just not as well engineered, but they have the price as if they were well engineered. Yeah, I mean, they... This generation, we could say, is at least better than the last one. Um, By far. Like the uh, the old clippers, the internal spring inside okay. of it, it would it would go at a certain point, and yeah. they were just they were just flopping around, yeah. right? Um, well, and the pivot point would wear out after about three or four weeks, and then yeah. you wouldn't get straight cuts anymore. Exactly, exactly. Interestingly enough, though, they're like uh, beginner clippers are just actually generic clippers oh. that they put a stamp on, and yes. they are better than... Way better than the uh, the expensive ones. Yep. Um, because it's it's no hullabaloo, right? It's not trying to have like, oh, this is our sleek design. It's just a workman's clippers, yeah, so to speak. Um, but there are other ones, right? What are the ones you recommend? Uh, the red grass ga- red grass games clippers, or any of the clippers like the Tamaya, or anything that is used for the gunpla models. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all phenomenal because. You look at like the sprues on the Bandai mm-hmm. stuff and some of those connection points are millimeters and you can't be going in there with a, what you're looking for with a set of cutters is a really fine ground blade mm-hmm. that comes to a very sharp 
point so that you can get it into these different tiny little areas sometimes where the gates are and we'll just provide a clean cut so the red grass games the tamaya cutters are amazing for that yeah they are pricey but for the same thirty dollars that you would spend for the gw cutters that last a month and a half two months um these things will last you I've been using the same set for like three or four years. Oh, wow. And they're just as sharp as they were the day one, and they get into any little corner and crevice I need. So, And so if you need, uh, in addition to your scalpels for your other hobby time, uh, you can also use these uh, these clippers. Yeah, yeah. If you need to get in those tiny little, Good little spaces. You fine can. veins. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, this is getting dark. Uh, we do not condone uh, dextering anyone, please. No, um. no, please don't. <laughs> please don't. Uh, next up, um, just in case you do not know, super glue and baking soda equals cement. It's literally a rock. Um, I highly recommend if you have a gap in a model and it's too much and you don't want to be green stuffing and all that other stuff, pack it with baking soda and hit it with a little bit of super glue. There's no more gap and you can sand it, file it. If you need to, if you are mounting magnets on bases, um, drop a drop a drop of super glue, put the magnet on there, and when it splooshes around the side, pour a little baking soda on that, and that magnet will never ever come loose, ever, 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 ever. Yep. Uh, as far as plastic cements go, uh, the two that I recommend, oddly enough, the GW cement is so good. It's a plastic cement. It's reasonably, it's liquid and it's reasonably thick. So it gives you a little bit of control. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the testers liquid cement. Don't the textures, the testers, uh, the tubes of that really thick glue. That's, that's for terrain. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't use it on models. Um, you'll have little strings everywhere and oh, <laughs> it's fine. You should have a tube for terrain and stuff because yeah. it makes, it welds the stuff. Um, but the two testers liquid cement is so good it's really thin mm -hmm. it's like the tamaya green and red bottles mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing except in a in an applicator tube yep um so good when you're building models always dry fit <laughs> can't stress that one enough um you'd be surprised you might think you have the right angle you know and then you realize after you've glued it you know and you're using some plastic <laughs> glue and you know it, it cements together and you're like wait a second why won't this shoulder pad go oh Oh, I did that weird. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with the newer GW models and the way they're engineering this stuff mm -hmm. to hide their own seams. Mm -hmm. And it's not always incredibly intuitive how it, how it fits together. Mm -hmm. But then when it does really snap into place, you're like, oh, my God, that is so perfect. Yeah. They are just, GW knocks it out of the park with their design of how models go together these days. But I was, I built a whole box of the free model of the month mm -hmm. thing. You know, I needed test models to prime so that I could test different contrast paints and what have you. Oh yeah. And so I just built up a whole bunch of those. Those don't come with instructions. You nope. just kind of have to figure them out. And it boggles my mind that you just snip all the stuff off the sprue. And it's pretty self-evident how it all goes together. Yep. And the way things just snap into place and they hide their own seams mm -hmm. oh gw you're so good at what you do <laughs> oh my god they really i mean they just they've nailed it they are so good but you still want to dry fit the stuff because like when you're building those uh the cultists with the arms in the back yeah it's really confusing to see how those actually go together because mm -hmm. it looks like those arms should not fit where they do yeah. until you actually get it to snap into place and you're like, oh, the chain connects to the outside. Oh, my God, that is so... The tolerance for that was so tight. <laughs> oh, it's so good. The leg bone's connected to the knee bone. You know, I, I just... Every time as I build models from different companies, I love building the AMG models, the Marvel Crisis Protocol stuff and the Shatterpoint, but they seem to sometimes not understand that some of these 11 piece models could be two pieces and you know they like well <laughs> there's models out there where the head is literally four pieces you know the back of the head the two sides and the face and you I, have to glue that all together i can't <laughs> mcp is not known for 
ease of putting models together. That's yeah. why you get like two to four per box. Or sorry, one to four per yeah. box because it's, it's it's not generally that hard, but it's still not efficient. And it's counterintuitive mm. most of the time. Yeah. So, oh, well. And, you know, Parabellum stuff goes together quite easily usually yeah and it's old style gw assembly it's just like this is a flat surface glue it to this flat surface and make it look the way you want it to look which is fine you know it's a great very rarely do i have issues with their kits except in some uh some of the older plastic kits are a little raw um, Nords, Nords, <laughs> spires yeah yeah definitely dry fit and plastic glue on plastic models yes it welds them together if you use super glue on plastic models because you're afraid you might have to take it apart you have an issue and you know take ulf's advice seek a therapist okay <laughs> literally i don't know how many times i've seen people drop a plastic figure from a foot above the nice soft gaming surface and watched it just shatter because they used super glue yep and you know again super glue has all kinds of tensile strength that has absolutely no shear strength whatsoever Correct. zero so just don't don't use it unless you're using resin models so moving on um if you have to mask stuff for your airbrush don't forget the absolutely easy you know you can get caught up in buying these liquid masks and all this other expensive junk when in reality if you have saran wrap or you know cellophane wrap in your house that's an amazing masking material yep. as well as silly putty you can buy hobby and they'll they call it flexible mask and all this stuff and it's it's freaking silly putty they colored it black yep. it's silly putty you can go to the dollar store and buy 10 tubes for less or 10 eggs worth of it for less than you would pay for hobby masking and it's the exact same thing so, yeah, just use the cheap Silly Putty to mask stuff. And what's wonderful about Silly Putty, after you sprayed it and the paint's on it, you just <gasps> squish it all back together. It's and, Silly Putty, for goodness sake. And it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't care. You reuse it endlessly. So, actually, you know, you should probably buy 12 so you can have a carton of eggs. I like it. There you go. There Thinking. you go, folks. Thinking. Okay, one other thing, and this is another call out to, I'm going to put up on the Discord. I did, um, I've been designing some stuff on for my 3d printer. Cause you know, it's new and it's cool. Um, I did make a paint cup with a brush holder. Um, so I wanted to get a separate paint cup for metallic paints. Cause I've been doing a lot of metallics lately. Uh, -huh. uh, hello, hundred kingdoms. And uh, <laughs> so never, ever, if you're going to wash a brush and you've used metallic paints, use a separate water bucket, because if you don't, what's going to happen is those mica flakes get into that paint water and then you go to paint something else, like, say, your nice, vibrant yellow. Uh -huh. Now, all of a sudden, you have a mica or a metal flake in your yellow, which does not have all the binders that the metal paints do, and that stuff starts to rust, and you have these little orange spots on your model that you have no idea where they came from. And you're like, what in the heck? And it's because you had metallic flakes in your paint water. So unless you're uh, painting Nurgle metal right when recommend it yes so but i have this cute little it's just a square box it has two little arms that go in you know two little uh things to hold your brushes that just slot down into it, it needs a little bit of sanding because depending on your printer it's not totally exact on the dimensions but it's real handy i love them so i'll make them available uh let's see what else magnetizing <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Something that can go awry in the worst possible way. <laughs> you know, and the simplest thing in the world to do is to get yourself a, you know, quarter inch, maybe half inch dowel, drill a little hole into the back, into either end of it, and mount opposite polarity magnets into that, and then color code the ends of that. That little tool will allow you to then magnetize any models that you make and always have the magnets be in the right polarity. Mm -hmm. You just basically make a mental note that on all of the bodies, I'm going to use the red side of the magnet and then just start pushing the magnets in and glue them. Mm -hmm. Then you flip the tool around and for all the arms and weapons and everything else that attaches to that model, you use the other side and you will be infinitely able 
to swap out your loadouts no matter what because you've followed a a plan you mm-hmm. all the body always has one orientation and all the add-ons have a different orientation so now you can you know you can put your ion cannons onto your space marines if you want to your tau ion cannon onto a <laughs> space marine because you magnetized it properly the so. uh the worst thing is when someone's putting a lot of love into a model and they got the wrong polarity and the, like arm and the arm just goes ping <laughs> you're like what's happening man you probably should have colored one side of that yeah <laughs> yeah See it yeah. happen it's 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 sometimes a hobby tragedy depending on the model oh yeah um you know, someone's putting together like a, a Warhound or something, and oops. I, I have done it with um, with Dreadnoughts. I have managed Ugh. to, I don't know what was in my brain at the time, but I got one side done properly. The other side, it did exactly opposite. Mm-hmm. And so when I went to swap the weapons, it was like, whoa, what, what, what have I done? <laughs> what, what, oh, so much for my melee and or ranged dreadnought. Now it's just going to get glued on. Yeah. Because that's the only way. The magnets won't come out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. I, I have I have made that mistake. And again, don't buy those magnet tools that you will find on the different sites that sell magnets and all. They are literally charging you big time money for what you can build for 11 cents. So, yeah, don't. Don't get caught up in that. And that's Bill's 11 cents on that. Yeah. (laughs) Because, you know, two cents is just, that's so boomer. (laughs) Inflation. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Inflation, Bill. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Sprue goo. If you haven't made yourself a thing of sprue goo yet, you probably should. And if you don't know what sprue goo is, you go out and you get the Tamaya. You can go to Hobby Lobby, Michael's, anywhere. Get the Tamaya plastic cement. It comes in a little like hexagon shaped bottle and it's about three quarters full of basically liquid acetone. Mm-hmm. You take a sprue from a model you've already built, chop it up into little bits, pour the bits into that bottle and stir. And what will happen is the acetone will break down the plastic and it will make it into a liquid plastic. Mm-hmm. And whenever you have to gap fill that is the perfect gap filler because A, it's the same plastic and B, it just flows into that crack and dries and it acts as cement for the model as well as filling your gaps. It's the most wonderful, awesome gap filling. You can throw away all your putties that you used to use if you have a nice little jar of sprue goo. Mm-hmm. So use it. It's awesome. And last but not least. Yeah, just recommending having... um for the types of glue that you keep, right? Having different types of applicators can be handy. Um, I've seen, you know, like having, like you have your normal nozzles. Sometimes yep. you need like a needle nozzle, yeah. right? Particularly like sprue goo type stuff, yes. right? Because you want to get into that fine little location, you know, whereas like if you have like, again, someone's using standard super glue, most of the time they don't have that kind of an applicator, yeah. right? Um, brushes for where it's appropriate, right? I found sometimes that brush applying glue um, in certain circumstances um, is even better. So, oh yeah. Um, just recommend you have, you know, expand your hobby tools and stuff. This one's not a priority, right? You're going to have probably like your standard glue that you use on most things for like plastic, right? Yeah. You have your super glue for resin, you know, and then all the ancillary stuff there, but, um, looking to making sure you have multiple applicators for things. There's always a different, the right tool for the right job, right? Yeah. Even if it's the same glue, what's the right tool, right? right? So that's my recommendation. Exactly. So just some thoughts to get you ready to build up that box of AOS 4.0, Stormcast, Eternals, and or Skaven. We're going to be entering a new era, and you might as well do it with some new ideas and happy thoughts and stuff. Speaking about entering a new era, how about ending an old one? Okay, let's do that. Yeah, book six of Dawnbringers. <laughs> Your or rules for a month. The third edition toilet. <laughs> and i don't mean that in a bad way because this book is actually really good I, I i you know as i sit here and dog it and tell you about the things it doesn't do please don't take that to indicate that this is not a good book again this book is hampered by the fact that i don't think it's going to sell all that well just because who wants to buy the last book of an edition to get rules that are going to exist for less than a month uh so it's more if you're like a lore nut or something, it's, you know. 
it's really okay. So the way the book starts out is they do a quick catch up. Mm -hmm. If you've not bought any of the books beforehand, you can read these little several paragraph long synopsis of the first five books. And then it takes all that stuff that they built up over the five books and throws it away (laughs) and starts a completely different story. And this story is, it's funny how, and you know, my serious recommendation here is go over to Doug's two plus tough Uh and watch his, it's a four part series on Don Bringer's book six and he covers it and encapsulates it perfectly. And then he does a part five where he does how the lore should have been done. (laughs) And, you know, again, he brings out the fact that it's not, you know, they're tying up loose ends of an edition. Yeah. That's what this book is for. And that's okay. But they literally took the first five books worth of build up uh-huh. and said, yeah, that don't matter. Here's our new story. Um, I mean, in the case of Corius Cole and, and Vandis, that oh, was a oh three God. edition build up. Oh my God. That was, that was such a great way to end third edition. Uh, we'll get to that. It's, yeah. it's, it's so the book starts out with your new baby lady um, <clears throat> or Archeon's baby mommy. Um, what is her name again? I can't think of her name. Abraxia. Thank you. Um, she is the new, you know, consort of chaos. She is the new sort of dark oath thing lady. Um, and she's getting together. She's talking with Archeon. Hey, I want you to wipe out a city. Boom, 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 boom. Do this, do this, do this. She gets ready. She's got her host, her army marching forward. And Belthanos, the Sylvaneth guy, just picks the perfect time to just run right through the middle of her army, splits it into two pieces, allows it to be basically destroyed in detail by the forces of good. Mm -hmm. And Braxy is pretty much screwed. Um, She is now infected. She has this curse. Uh It's messing with her mind, which is a common theme in all of this book. Um, people's minds are being warped. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought they're all stoned. Basically from the things that they do. Yeah. Yeah. They're stoned. They're, they got a hold of mushrooms or something. Warp stoned. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, definitely. Anyway, <laughs> she has to retreat uh, big time and she gets a hold of Archeon who is not amused that he didn't get his city that he wanted and he basically gives her this very cryptic hint about in order to get rid of this curse that's afflicting you, you have to get this MacGuffin. And I'm not going to spoil it so that you can either watch the video or read the book because it's it's a good read. You know, again, these are little snippet stories. So three or four pages is the most any particular, ep- you know, episodic thing is going to be mm-hmm. so you can just sort of pick it up and put it down whenever you want to and it's it's really good i have to say the writing in this is is engaging it's fun and but basically long story short she figures out that of all the cities and all the bars in the world <laughs> she has to go to Phoenicium, mm-hmm. which in in three editions Phoenicium has one of the coolest backstories ever in aos and they have done absolutely nothing with it for three editions <laughs> and so they wipe it out <laughs> they're like well we tried we failed let's let's kill it so this is the home of you know the phoenix guard and all that stuff and blah 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 but she decides she has to go there nobody's been able to take the city in three editions i mean three thousand years or whatever <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm getting at um so they make you know, Phoenicium is where they have to go, mostly because that's where all the elves went. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's the the primal uh, of the beast. I'm not going to go. I'm, stop right there. Read it. It's fun. I don't want to spoiler it, but there's a reason why Phoenicium is really really cool and why it hasn't been. It's never. It's been sacked several times. They've tried to. Chaos has tried to take it and failed miserably. Well, this time they figure out that what we have to do is. We have to go all stormcasty, and we have to come from the sky. So they whip up a big old storm, and then it rains dark oath people. And they have this other, 
this all, the the mountain that Phoenicium is built into is now all of a sudden Recon made of tree sap. <laughs> so there's like these forests that have been leaking sap into the area for thousands and mo- for millennia, mm-hmm. and the mountains are just basically coagulated sap. Okay. So when they bust through the mountain and they tunnel through the mountain, it's it's the it's the old Boston molasses story, you know, uh-huh. back in the 1800s when they you had that huge tank of molasses that broke mm-hmm. in Boston and literally people were killed by an onrushing wave of molasses. Yep. running through the streets. It, it, and it sounds funny, you know, oh, I could just eat my way out of that. No. No, it's it was it was deadly. And same thing, Phoenicium just, <laughs> it gets all sappy, so. I mean, just because it's edible tar doesn't mean that you're going to be able to get out of it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, and then, you know, Phoenicium goes away. There's a big council of the good guys, and Vandis Hammerhand is at the council, and there's a group that wants to just hunker down in the cities and defend the cities and get ready for this oncoming chaos, Dark Oath incursion. And then there's Vandis, <laughs> who is like, I can blunt this attack by going out and seeking out Corgus Cole and his army. And by doing that, I will save the cities and the war will be fought, you know, far away from the city walls. And we will still be able to build up the cities and, and not have to build up after the destruction. And yeah, you know, the council is like, that's the dumbest idea we've ever heard. But they end up doing it <laughs> because story. Oh, uh, yeah. We got to love it. Vandis, you're so cool. So he basically leads the hosts out. Meanwhile, the Dark Oath people are all getting together. Mm-hmm. And as Dark Oath people will normally do, they get together around a bonfire. They're eating beans. They're farting. They're having a grand old time. And they're telling tales of their renown and the things that they see themselves doing. And all of a sudden it occurs to them that they're all having the same visions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're all seeing the same kind of, this is me fighting a great but fuzzy entity. What the hell? On the good guy side, Vandis is starting to have vision. Well, he's had visions uh, since forever, but he is being driven crazy by these visions. Of course, Abraxi is being hounded by these visions what could this all be you know hint new edition um so yeah they have fomo (laughs) (laughs) so long story short a couple of the dark oath people rise to prominence and they're they're very cool very really well done characters and the war begins i won't spoil how everything goes down but you know, since I mentioned Vandis Hammerhand, the good guys are incredibly stupid. Yes. And yes, Vandis is at the point of obsession with Corgus Cole. He always has been. Oh, yeah. Corgus Cole, meanwhile, is actually fleshed out to be a lot more of a thinker than you might imagine. Mm-hmm. And he needs a, he needs the head of a storm host. It doesn't have to be Vandis Hammerhand. Mm-hmm. He put that restriction on himself. And when he realized he just needed any of them, he was like, oh, you mean this is an objective-based game? Oh. oh. Yeah. So he goes after, yeah. And he he kills a guy and gets a skull. And so he ascends. Meanwhile, Vandis has led all the armies away from the cities and, um, you know, gotten engaged while the cities stand defenseless. Long story short, right when you don't think things could get any worse for Vandis and the good guys, they do. And that's when the vermin come. The Skaven just sort of, hey, you know what this map needs? It needs a city. It <laughs> needs a city of rats. So, yeah, boom, Skaven Blight City becomes a thing. Great passage in the book. Read it. It's You got this guy climbing a mountain because he's like, I know some bad stuff is coming and I need to be as high as possible. And he just literally watches as this gnaw hole, this Skaven gnaw hole just erupts into the biggest gnaw hole ever recorded. 
And from the center of it, just this city pops up and you're, and he's like, well, that sort of changes everything. Yeah. <laughs> and the book ends, the lore part ends. Obviously we know exactly where AOS 4.0 is going to pick up. Well, I gotta say, I gotta give it to my board, Corcus Cole. Um, he's been traipsing through three editions, pining after Vandis, and he finally, he finally got it. Yeah. What I want to see now in Blades of Corn? Yes. Corgus Coulson. He has got to become a named character after the treatment they gave him here and how they made him so much more of an intelligent, driven, and focused leader. They've got to make a model and a, well, he has a model, but they have to make him a thing. Well, I imagine what he could be for AOS 4.0 is he could be sort of their their centerpiece for Blade of Corn, right? Because you yeah. have your generic big demon. Yeah, Abraxi is going to be leading the the Varen Guard and the main chaos. Yep. She's, you know, the new Archeon. And yeah, you could use Corgus as everything else. Absolutely everything else. Well, he'll do for Blades, right? But yeah, then who do they cool. do for, uh, I mean, they don't have any big named Magakin guys, right? <laughs> And no, that means that gives them the well. Wait, no, the Glockin, I guess would be yeah, Glockin or you know Rodigus. Or, yeah, I mean you can do. They have a they have an open palette. They can they can play however they want. I think like they did have a few named characters in in Blades of Corn, but and and Corgus Cole being one of them, right? Yeah, but like now he he should be a demon prince, a named demon prince. Yeah, and he is like I mean he's ascended. Yeah, it's it's it official. happened. Yeah, it's he won. Vandas lost. I'm shocked. Um, so yeah, it's make them a thing. I want to. I want to. And if they don't make them a thing, I will. Yeah. So <laughs> I can say the one thing about Vandas this time is he didn't run away. Amazingly, yes. And I think it's because he had all that rat stuff in his brain. Yeah. He forgot to run away. So yeah, it's just we are on that precipice of all the bad things you can imagine are happening to the good guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of it through their own doing, but we're in this perfect place to have the Skaven come out and just become the force that drives the next edition. Yeah. And that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah, I agree. Love to see it. So, I mean, I'm glad that they did parlay into the, the new edition. Yes. Right. Uh, with this book, instead of just being sort of like, and we'll just kind of leave it there and mm -hmm. we're in the new edition. Right. Um, Cause like all of a sudden there's cruel boys and Cragnos. And, yep. Um, now, the path to glory and the, the narrative stuff in this book is kind of weird, and it's funny, and it seems like just page filler stuff, but it's really, really, it's a throwback that's so much fun. And in fact, they literally, on, on page 84, there is a call out to the two Realms of Chaos books where they pulled all this stuff from. Yeah. And it's just, I love how they're like, you know... In the old days, this worked really well. Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good because the 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 it's basically Anvil of Apotheosis, and you make yourself a aspiring warlord, chaos warlord, and then you just use all the tables to give him all the cool stuff, and you build him the way you want, and then you just go out and there's a character sheet in here. There's some scenarios in here, and you literally just build a chaos warlord of your very own so cool it's so i was so shocked when i saw that not only did they put this in the book but they also put that little call out and said here's your nostalgia moment for the day yeah if you remember the old realms of chaos books yep. you're gonna love this <laughs> now if you don't if you don't have any tie to that that old time it did it's this is going to have zero impact other than the fact that you can build a really cool chaos hero. I mean, about time. I mean, what else is there to say about that? Like, I think that chaos, I mean, anvil apotheosis, always cool. Yes. Right. And that you kind of had something like this from before. Right. But chaos lends itself to it so much. Like they are generally speaking when it comes to slaves to darkness, right. Indescript war bands, right. Yep. They are, here's your generic chaos warriors. You have your dark oath, blanks yep. right um new marauder kit by the way oh, <laughs> and and the cavalry and the chieftain and i was like y'all knock this one out of the park and i think i've been most impressed with gw sculpts for the dark oath over the last couple of years than i have almost any other of their model ranges so gorgeous so well done 
and evocative of the lore that they put together. Oh, yeah. So kudos, huge, huge kudos to them for wrapping up third edition with something that could have been a true dud. Yeah. And actually making it super cool. Yep. And, you know, do I recommend you run out and buy this book? No. 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 It, it's it's a sort of Damocles thing. Mm. These these things are going to exist for less than a month. But if you really dig the lore and if you really dig the idea of building a Chaos Warlord, do it. it mm-hmm. It's so much fun. It's ridiculously fun. And I was just looking through the tables and just going, oh, this is going to be so good because the port to fourth will probably be in a white dwarf. <laughs> you know, it's it's literally going to be change this to this, this to this, this to this, uh, and you're done. Yeah. And you can see that things were written to be kind of future proof, but not completely because um, it has to operate in this edition, but it's going to be so easy to maneuver it into the new one. So, yeah, I, I would overall, it's a really good book. My, my number one knock is they spend five books building us up on these crusades. And then in this ultimate book, there's a couple of throwback pages and a little, yeah, this is what happened with the cities that, that were founded under the crusade. And thanks for playing. We'll see you in fourth. And (laughs) you're just like, wow. Okay. But the strength of the story is that whole maneuvering of the dark oath. And it's a dark oath book. Yeah. You know, you have to understand that. And it's fleshing them out, giving them extreme personality and a sandbox to play in. Mm-hmm. So overall, very good book. Very, very good book. Impressed but disappointed with how it could have been done. Again, go to Doug's channel on YouTube. It's two plus tough. Um and follow along with his discussion of the lore and then most importantly uh his part five where he talks about how he thinks it should have been done brilliant just brilliant yeah um doug's my number one go-to for for lore breakdowns oh god yeah if i'm not going to be reading it um and i mean if you've been listening to the podcast for a long time you you probably already know doug you probably knew about doug before you knew about us sure and, uh it's just, it's just quality. Go to listen to him. I, mm-hmm. I, I enjoy him um, quite a bit. So can't recommend that enough. And we are, we're now finally clear of it. Yes. We're clear of the uh, Dawnbringer slog. Yeah. Six books to get us to what really matters, rats. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's cut to the chase. <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, but that is like such a huge thing. You think about like lore-wise since like uh, Skaven Blight City exists like in its own pocket dimension. Yeah. Right? And... I mean, just the plans of the Skaven. I mean, they, they we talked they talked about it in the other like lore stuff, big stuff oh, yeah. coming up. That like now the Great Horned Rat is going to properly ascend to be the fifth Chaos God. You which, betcha. Um, hello, like we almost have that going on in in forty k. Yeah, right. Um, now that oh God, what's his name? The robot dude. He's trying. He's essentially trying to ascend to become the fifth I, Chaos God. I know, and I'm. Why am I blanking on him right now? <laughs> Me too. But, but you know neutral like our undivided chaos robot god right yeah um to the point where like the silent king magnus and robote gilliman are all going to stop him well yeah. it sounds like ain't nothing stopping the great horned rat because he uh hooked up with the right guy yeah archeon's like i got you but being able to like drag or at least a portion of skaven blight city through a gnaw hole right has so many implications for the power that oh. they actually have blows my mind yeah Um, and it's just a great it's a great story intro into how they're going to develop the fourth fourth edition lore and i'm telling you it's uh i this is to me it could be an indication of their understanding that the mortal realms are too vast Mm -hmm. and they need to be a lot more connected Mm -hmm. and they need to matter a little bit more and if the rats can basically burrow from one to the other, mm-hmm. that means everybody can. And, you know, yeah, okay, there's realm gates and, you know, you can use it. And realm gates are few and far between. And it's that's a thread that they didn't really pick at all that much because in the early points it was a MacGuffin and now it's an afterthought. 
Skaven being able to just go, boom, we're in Shaman, boom, we're in Axie, boom, we're here, boom, we're there. Good guys are going to have to come up with a counter to that. And so I think fourth edition we'll see a tightening up of the realms, I hope. Uh, we'll see. I mean, the Skaven have always been that, you know, that group that can just pop out of nowhere, you know, like when Nagash was trying to do his his shtick <laughs> in, in 2-0, and they just, like, popped into the Black Pyramid because they were curious, and it, like, created endless spells. And yeah. then um, what was the one, I think it was at the uh, Broken Realm stuff in the uh, Silver Tower where you had the the Skaven, like, Mission Impossible team that went yeah. in with the Warp Stone Bomb and yeah. dropped it, then just, like, pieced out a gnaw hole. Yeah. Like, they've always had this capability, but it doesn't yeah. seem like anyone else has this capability. Like, no one can really harness Warp Stone. And not the way they do. Yeah. I mean, they may be able to touch it a little bit, but they are willing to sacrifice who knows how many of, of the rats. And it doesn't matter because they all just keep coming back because they're, they're rats. For they're rats. <laughs> I mean, come on. But I mean, like that, that, uh, that intro. Right, uh, they did for four O, where oh, you have the Stormcast come down outside Skaven Blight City and start <laughs> fighting them, and I was like, that was like no rats. That was like that was no substantial amount of population of rats, and they worked you all down to three dudes. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> oh, I, I I can't wait. But uh, new box, so stoked. The freaking uh, terror that they released for the Skaven, that monstrosity. Oh, I was just <laughs> fawning over it. The Next glow up on level. the night Azeros too, a named <sighs> night Azeros. I saw that and I was like, Bill's probably a little just giddy right now. A little jazzed. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I like just the old man with the beard. I mean, that head's going to be used anywhere. Someone's oh. not using it. You know, someone's Dear like, gosh. oh, I have my generic. Can I have the head, please? I want yeah, that one. just give me the head. But the monstrosity, I was like, dang, is it small enough to put on a blood bowl? <laughs> blood bowl, bitch. So Ooh. I can use it for uh, my special guy. No, it's probably going to be. Uh, quite the monster. Yeah. Um, one would think. You know, having a hell pit abomination, having that on the field. Maybe they're going to be like, guys, we're really redoing this line. Molders coming for blood. Yeah. Um, one thing that was noticeably absent from the faction focus for, and we're transitioning to faction focuses now, folks. Mm -hmm. Noticeably absent from the faction focus for rats was Eshin being yeah. in the index. Yeah. But Screech still has benefits for clan Eshin in his like different clan things he can pick oh, yeah. each round. Yeah. I hope that means we're getting some sick ninja rats when the book drops. Mm. I mean, I bet that line's going to be like truly revamped it, when that comes out. Yeah. It looks completely, it looks all new and it just, it looks so good. So, so good. Uh, Bill. Yeah. Faction focuses. Faction focus. Which one is your favorite? Which one is my favorite? It's got to be the Maggot Kin. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Just because it's going to be so much easier to play, so much easier to manage. You know, like we were talking about earlier, none of this poison one through freaking 45, and if this happens, you got this and then this, and it, it, now it's your poison, D3, mortal wounds. You're not poison? Okay, you don't worry about it. It's... Gameplay wise, going to be so much easier, and it just looks to me like Magikin are going back to that idea of mm -hmm. here we are. You have to slog through us, and we are just going to be this presence on the battlefield that is annoying you to no end. We're spreading our poisons, and you're going to have, it's going to take you a while to chew through us yeah. and our blight Kings and our other monsters and our other flyers are going to be out there doing what they do. while we have a nice solid core to build off of and mm -hmm. take objectives with. So it more power, just more power to it. My hope against hope is that Stormcast will actually be something of value in this edition. I think they're a faction focus preview it was pretty early on right yeah i think it would tend to indicate they are going to be that elite fighting force that yeah. actually has some stay right yes i mean what liberators have crit mortal on on their base profile mm -hmm. and that's their base troop yeah period yeah right it doesn't get any further down than that everything else just gets better from there yeah you know? things move on up and as long as they cost them and point them appropriately you know which is where they've always had that issue before 
They'll make a really cool Stormcast unit and they'll point it into Oblivion or it'll be way too cheap for what it does and they'll nerf it to death. I'm a Liberator's what, our base three save? Yeah. Um, Brick of five where you have mm-hmm. crit mortals, you have Rand on board immediately. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> when I saw Rand on a Liberator, I was like, okay. Yeah. We're I think s- I think we got there, folks. I think we got there. Um, new models look great too. Yeah. Um, annihilators being literal shield walls. Like, I don't know how people are gonna chew through those without just ripping mortals. You yeah. know? Um, I think they have good promise. I think they have really good promise this edition. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. But let's start off on our list. Um, so <laughs> you have to talk about the elephant in the room or perhaps the BDSM elephant in the room. Um, the Slanesh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been bemoaned all over the internet, so I mean, we're not new to this stuff. But I got to say, it was the most meta rule set ever because in order for you to get any type of benefit, you have to convey a benefit to your opponent that punishes you. Yes. Right? Yes. So uh, you get uh, you try to hope for some pleasure, but you get punished by pleasuring your opponent instead. I said it that way. I did. Um, and it's it's torture. It is just really bad. Um, it's so bad. It's I. Yeah, it, I don't know how it unless there is a lot of stuff that we haven't seen. Mm-hmm. Basically, the the snippets that they've given us in the faction focus point to. These really are going to be not fun to play. They're yeah. just not going to be fun to drive. And I can't say that about any other faction that I've seen the faction focus on. Mm-hmm. They're just, I don't know. I don't know why they would do it that way, but yeah, perhaps yeah. there's more to it that we don't see. I mean, conveying, I'm like, if you were able to, without the major drawback, right, be able to get a crit, two hits, and then run and shoot or charge yeah um as an ability you pick on three units that you can rotate well that sounds really good yeah that's something i can get behind until you realize that for every unit you pick you give your opponent a temptation dice that they can use to auto six anything or auto box cars a charge if they've got two or yeah it's and the drawback you have a 33 percent chance of taking d3 mortal wounds yeah it's it's such a double-edged sword where the really sharp edge is pointed towards you. So, yeah, but I mean, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, um, you know, you just run yourself into the knife, you know, just a little bit. And the Not thing all the is, way. is if you start winning with Slanesh, it you're going to feel good cuz you've yeah. overcome you've overcome some obstacles and and it's obviously going to be doable. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of hue and cry on the internet about their ability. So, <laughs> we'll see how long it lasts. It they, you know, they might be the ad mech of of AOS. Yeah, I think they will be. Um, Lumineth? God, they... My favorite thing about the Lumineth one, I was reading through it, and it took me a while to figure it out. And so I was glad that I was right when I watched some of the videos later on. But when I was reading it, I was like, so uh, Ella and Ella, they have mm-hmm. um, the freaking stupid Twilight spell or whatever it was. Yeah. Like, and I was like, oh, wait, it's on their it's on their war scroll. Yeah. It's on this. So that must mean it's probably not in the actual in spell the lore. lore. Yes. And, and then they fixed it, too, um, in the sense that it's like the first command ability used by a unit within, I think, 18 inches yeah. uh, of them has to double. I was like, thank you. Dear God, that to me was like the second most toxic thing in the game next to the uh, NPE temptation dice that Slanesh yeah. handed out in 3-0. Yep. Right. Yep. It's like they actually fixed that. And then like I'm looking at the units. They're not all spellcasters now. Right. Oh goodness, the wardens actually look like they they do what they should be doing. Yep. You know, across the board, the changes for LRL look so much and it puts them more into I play AOS just like you do now. Yep. You know, yeah. <laughs> Instead of every one of my units as a spellcaster, you right. can't stop it, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. No more of those courts crystal things anymore they just have built in you know lightning fast reflexes you know it's it's what we talked about before like it, as we go through all this stuff it's it's streamlining design right it's it's making it so you don't have unnecessary rules that clog up the game yeah and all that stuff and it's and bookkeeping roles you know oh. the poison mechanics the this mechanic the that mechanic all of which that just ended up where you're doing so much tracking that you're losing your immersion in the game 
yep. because you're having to track so much mechanical stupidity. Yeah, they get rid of that, which is, you know, a very welcome, very welcome thing. OBR is a new army is your, what? Yeah, they just don't operate the same. Like, yeah. they don't have, like, those special rules and stuff. You have essentially six abilities that you can pick from depending on the phase. It's usually two per phase, Yeah, right? It's not the same thing as having, like, you know, your discipline. Yeah. Right? It's Relentless just, discipline. Yeah. Again, a mechanic that bogged the game down oh, yeah. for one of the players and became more of a mechanical issue that you had to manage as opposed to moving models around the table and fighting with them. Yeah. So super good change. I think it's, like I say, it's a new army. It's because of that, right? Yeah. Like the, what was their core existence with Relentless Discipline has yep. now been baked into, I mean, I think they still called it that. Yeah. But um, you just having certain abilities you can use at certain stages with certain units. Yep. And... I think initially it's not going to be much nuance to OBR in terms of like what abilities you use and when, because I think it'll be, no, this is the right one to use here. This is the right one to use here. But what it speaks to me is that they are in fact trying to make OBR the tactician's army that it's supposed to be. Yeah. I have all these subset of abilities that I can use in certain phases, right? Once per turn. And so it's, it's sort of, like maneuvering everything to get it exactly how you need to be, which is like catacros. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm excited to see what that does. You know, I mean, otherwise, I mean, there's mostly the same functional thing with like where they show Vakmordian and yeah. the uh, toilet chair guy, <laughs> Soul Mason. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, GW, for these amazing models. <laughs> right. Well, you got to make sure that when you build that model, you got to glue that actual like finger bone on the end that you can just tap. <laughs> <laughs> That's after dark. But uh yeah, it just it just seems different, like so different from what it's it's been before. Cause again, it's it's not like Magakin, right? Where you know you used to tick up the poison yeah. counters and then like you'd roll the dice and still do mortals. They got more like simplified in the sense that it's just if you're infected, then at the end of the turn I do the same roll. Yeah. And it's I roll a D three on a two plus, you you take that many mortals. Right. But this isn't like, that's not OBR. OBR yeah. used to be, I have all these different abilities on different commanders and stuff, so and I can build a nuance. It was all nuance. so layered yeah. that it got to be managing buff management and a, uh, discipline point management became yeah. the focus of your play as opposed to playing the game on the table against your opponent. You yeah. were more internalized as an OBR player to where you would almost, I mean, obviously... But you you didn't really, in an average game time, in a timed round, you didn't have a lot of time to engage with your opponent. You were figuring out your own stuff and engaging with the other guy as an afterthought. And that's boring gameplay. And some people really loved it and it was engaging. But by and large, for casual play, not so much. Yeah. And I just think they're going to be better for it. Um you got Daughters of Cain, Ideneth Deepkin, Gloom Spike gets a Night Haunt. Still, they uh, they do what they say on the tin again. Yeah. And still, they don't, you know, Daughters of Cain, some things morph, some things change. They talked about, you know, Marathi Cain being a little bit different, but she's not so different that you're like, oh, that's not Marathi anymore. Yeah. It's, it's, they're going to play the way you figure daughters should play. Yeah. You still have the, uh... Thing that makes her her, you know, with the three wounds, you know, per turn thing. Mm-hmm. That, like, no one else in the game has, which right. is great, because that's yeah. her identity. But Daughters of Cain is, and for all those Daughters of Cain players out there, still going to play largely like Daughters of Cain always did. Yeah. I think that Deepkin, very similar, because they have similar tables, right, uh, with the ebbs and flows of the tide. Uh, big change to the uh, shield deals, though. They no longer have the unrendable. They just have a ward. Yeah. You know, it's it's all these, like, subtle differences, you know. And it's but. a mechanical change that just speeds it up. Yeah. And I don't think effect-wise it's going to be that big of a deal. I agree. But it's going to play quicker, so yay. Courage on overlords don't fly high no more. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, though, because they, they literally will transport their troops up, and they can use the boats for cover. I was like, yes. okay, this is... Thank you. It's still in the same spirit, you yep. know. Um. And the frigate having that one ability where it can like charge into combat and every unit it took with it dumps out into combat. Yes. Like that's going to be strong. And that makes me now feel like KO is going to play like their lore says they play. 
Yeah. Instead of this just weird sort of, I, I don't know, their play style to me has always been so strange. Now it's going to be like the big boats cover the little boats. The little boats go in to take ground. Yeah. And to take things away from the enemies. And now it's going to kind of play like that. And so, they get a buttload of shooting combat. Oh, dear God. I'll if have... you want to shoot, <laughs> throw away any army that you have and buy KO. Yeah. Being able to, hey, I just charged this turn and I'm going to shoot you in the combat phase. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of guns that do that. And that can become oppressive very quickly. So we're going to have to see. <laughs> I, I'm i not sure if the KO aren't going to go skyrocketing to the top because the gun line that you're going to be able to put together and be able to put that gun line wherever you want it, I think is going to be super strong. It's going to be very punishable, mm -hmm. but the ability to just sort of ignore deployment errors, mm -hmm. I think is really sweet. And it's going to yeah. be a very flexible play style. And playing against it, you're going to really have to think about defense and depth mm -hmm. because they could just be anywhere. They can reach places that you don't think they should. At the same time, I think it's less of a NPE situation where they were just like, all their boats would fly high. Mm -hmm. They come down just where they need to be. They yeah. drop, you know, um, you know, an endless spell on you. Yeah. And then they're just like gun line you down and then they peace out, yeah. you know? Uh, I think that them being more aggressive with the delivery mechanism is great. There's one thing I'm really interested in the rules with the uh, Thunderers because it says that if they did not, I think, move that turn, um, they uh, they get all their weapons get shoot in combat, not yeah. just some of them. So if you got the frigate doing its charge, and let's say they didn't move, yeah. do they get to drop out into combat and shoot in combat? Because that's going to be disgusting. Yes, it would. That's oh, gonna, my God. And, and I, I think it's a once game ability i have to double check it but i think it is yeah you know but being able to deliver that much in melee shooting is ridiculous i love it though it is um, it's, I, it's, it's amazing you know and every army should have a unit that or a thing that it can rely on to reliably delete someone else's unit when you have to and you know it's just i hate to say it but if units don't die it's not a fun game oh true and now units are going to die. So um, ogres, uh, more consistent play style, mortals on the charge, feast on flesh. Um, overall, the changes to ogres, I think, put them more into a destruction mentality. Oh, yeah. And a in-your-face, beat-you-down play style, which, I mean, toward the end of third, they got back into with the changes that they got but now this just i think it reinforces everything about ogres either hungry or eating ogre just pound yeah yeah i mean because it says on their abilities they they've got the move until you use feast on flesh right yeah and so it's not just am i hungry or am i feasting right it's not right. both it's like once you use feast on flesh then you are no longer like starving you know right which is like well thematically that makes sense even though they're always starving if they're not eating um, but the biggest change for them, um, not biggest change, but the biggest boon for them in this new edition is the three inch reach for all units. Yeah. Cause the, what got them kind of back into the game a little bit at the end is when they changed co coherency yes. for, you know, six models can be just lined out. Yep. I mean, now being able to take bricks of 18 gluttons and they're all going to be able to smash in. I'm, I'm here. I'm yeah. here for it. It's going to be, it's going to be fun looking again. Um, I really, really wish they would talk a little bit about um, the other side of ogres, but eh, we'll see what happens when they come out. <laughs> the best they did was give us the huskard on on Stonehorn. You're like, who takes a huskard on Stonehorn? It's uh, <laughs> you know, uh, come on, guys. It's we some, some of us really like those guys. Um, it should have been Frostlord, Frostlord on Stonehorn. Yeah. That is the ideal one. Frostlord, to, on, that's what you do. Yeah. And then, uh, what well, I mean now with the Maw, right? Um, that new uh, centerpiece. Oh, yep. I can't wait to see what that does. Um, Soul Blight. Uh, they still return in models, Bill. Did you read that? Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, you want to talk about reinforcing your play style? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, this is the death faction that 
we think of when we think of generic death. Just, yep. okay, I wiped out everything but one. Oh, <laughs> that was a mistake because now they're back yeah. at full. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. And, but again, that's their, that's their play style. That's their shtick. Mm -hmm. it's what they do and getting rid of the graveyards thank you oh that's perfect and now it's tied to terrain so oh boy (laughs) that that makes a little spicier it does and it it's it when you think about how it's going to interact and play with different against generic factions you know against stormcast against you name it Mm. it's going to be just very simple and very direct and this is how i get my guys back you start taking factions that are a little bit more terrain dependent Mm -hmm. your sylvaneth um even your obr to an extent Mm -hmm. um now all of a sudden that that changes the landscape of how they have to think about who they're fighting yeah and where these units are going to start popping up from and reinforce from and it just it's going to be it makes soul blight graveyard grave lords a much different play style in death that you don't see in the other ones and is really really fun and it's kind of i hate to say it's like a throwback Mm -hmm. but it sort of is it's it's kind of the way you used to think about the generic death faction night haunt are still going to be night haunt they do the night haunt things yeah um obr now has a play style that's i think a little bit more direct and simple um, we don't know where flesh eater courts are going to be, but soul blight is what you think of when you think generic death. Oh yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, I like what I've seen on just about everything. And I like to see Slanesh getting punished just cause I hate them. <laughs> but, um, oh man, but I mean, we still have a few more to go. I mean, we still have iron jaws. We sell yes. blades of corn slaves to darkness. Um, that's a big one. So many that we still need to see faction focus Sylvaneth. for Sylvaneth. Um, I don't see Sylvaneth changing a whole lot other than that. I hope to God they're just going to rework that the entire terrain, you know, the throwing out wild woods like no tomorrow. Did they do Sylvaneth? I don't think so. I remember they? something about the woods coming back. Hold on. Let me just double check. No, they didn't do it. They must have talked about it in somewhere else. Um, I imagine Sylvaneth is going to be just like the uh the skaven for the wild woods like yeah if you have less than three you can bring one right um i was really surprised by the change to cruel boys where their dirty tricks aren't just something you do <laughs> at the very beginning of the game and that's it i know um now that you can do dirty tricks every single turn and however many you do makes it more difficult or less you know i thought that was really cool because that was their shtick but it wasn't really a shtick it was once per once per battle at the beginning of the game you could yeah. do a thing um yeah and it felt very unfulfilling and it led to almost nothing over the course of the game yeah and now it it's going to be it it really is their signature style it is yeah. what they do and it looks like it's going to breathe life into them i think i really do think they're going to benefit from that mm-hmm. i don't know if the bad taste in everyone's mouth about cruel boys is going to go away that's a tough one i mean they opened up 3-0 with cruel boys and great models yeah. you know a fantastic design some of the most beautiful models mm-hmm. and they uh, did like nothing <laughs> and they did like next to nothing. <laughs> play style that was oh 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 really is that what you do oh that's so cute yeah. we'll put that on the refrigerator thank you ringo yeah um <laughs> it's it was just like, wow, you are the redheaded stepchildren of destruction. Yeah. And not even, you don't even have good redheads. No. So, um, oh, and did you hear they're not going to do flyer slayers in version four? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Elf. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the cycling runes, you know, once per battle type thing, good effects. I think that, I think fire slayers are going to have like, I mean, they'll they'll be like most armies in, in the release are going to be middle of the pack, right? Right. I don't really see t- terribly too many outliers. I mean, Doc still has its strengths and and all that, but we haven't seen all the all the war scrolls. Yeah, so I can't say that it's... they're going to come in and, and dominate again. Though I think Sons of Beamont might have a chance. The update to the what is it? The smashy dude. Yeah, that like destroys terrain. He had a ridiculous ability that they gave him, uh, where I think it's his rampage, where he can just like 
essentially pile in and do like 46 mortals to to a unit hold on let me pull that up it just it shocked me when i saw it and i was like so everyone's just going to take a bunch of gate crashers that's what they are gate crash yeah yeah they're just going to gate crash the crap out of everyone because that's a stupid ability king broad looks solid too just going to say that it's you know they have always suffered from the fact that this game is designed to be units fighting against units and in a faction where your units are four it's very hard to balance something like that you can make them too strong and then they become very unfun to play against or you can make them too weak which is kind of the way they've leaned yeah and again it's not fun for that player so hopefully they strike a nice middle ground in this one and I have to say that by doing all of the indexes all at the same time, they can really take a hard look at balance across the board. And you know what? When the books come out, they can get the tweaks they need. We have to understand going Mm -hmm. into this, it's just like 40K. Yep. Some factions are going to have an interaction that they did not foresee, and they're going to be off the hook good, and that's going to be, they're going to be the Eldar of AOS. And some factions are going to be just so handicapped by their numbers that they just don't play well they'll fix it yeah just give it some time one of the things that we always used to not be able to say about gw was if your book was bad you're dealing with three years of a bad book yeah these days that's not the truth they do not do that anymore they are very willing to fix things as they come up and Understand that when 4th edition hits, yes, there's going to be some crazy combos and it's going to look like a very weird landscape. Just let it let it ride. Because yeah. you know we're going to have a day one fact <laughs> and everybody's going to be angry and Discourse is going to talk about how it's the end of Warhammer. Okay, fine. Just deal with it. Understand that day one, we're going to get a bunch of changes to the indexes. Deal with it. Move along. Play the game have fun and we're all going to enjoy aos 4.0 because it's going to be a better game no i don't i i don't disagree i'm just saying that we're going to have uh i'm going to call them pirouetting gate crashers or gate breakers oh um, yeah because uh that pulverizing strike any combat phase not just yours yes, any, combat, any phase, combat phase pick up a unit in combat with this unit to be the target this unit makes a pylon then roll a dice on a four plus and inflict 46 mortal damage to the target so four d six and um so I'm taking four, three gate breakers. Four to twenty four. Yeah, okay. So that eliminate okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing sons. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hey, it's one of the cheapest armies. It really yeah. And just uh, how hard is it to get I don't know. Maybe there's a limit <laughs> of gatekeepers. We don't know. We don't know. We don't so know. Well, there's be. no limit on gatekeepers in these games, but <laughs> but gate breakers, maybe they'll gate be breaker, gatekeepers. Wow. Gate breakers. There might be, you know, it might be one per army. You might be limited to one of each kind of giant. Who knows? We'll see. It'll be fun, trust me. I I believe in their ability to everything strikes me right now as The team that did AOS is taking all the hints and tips and ideas from the team that did 40K. Yeah. So our release, our new edition release, will probably be a little less rocky, but it doesn't mean it's going to be a very smooth paved road. Understand there's going to be a couple of potholes and some ruts and the curbs are going to be weird, but we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be a blast. And there's a lot of armies that are going to get a lot of new life just from looking at these faction focuses with the exception of Slanesh, Mm -hmm, I -hmm. don't see anything in any of them that I can look at and say, that's broken. It's going to dominate or that's broken. They're not going to be able to play the game. Yeah. Except Slanesh, Um, (laughs) (laughs) which I'm in full support of. I don't like them. So yeah, I'm just, I cannot wait. I am so looking forward to this. It hurts. Bring it on. Bring me. Fourth edition. I'm excited. Do it now. I'm excited. I'm. I want my new rats. I want to be playing a lot of spearhead. Um, spearhead is what interests me the most. Um, out the gate, uh, just because I don't know what the landscape is going to be for the indices, but I do know for spearhead, just like they did for combat patrol, it's yep. it's super well balanced. Yep. I mean, that was thing about combat patrol it was so great. And even in combat patrol, it was usually like a fifty fifty 
or like 49.9 to 50.1 yeah. percent win rate um, in those games because they were so balanced. Yeah. And so it sounds like Spearhead's even better than that. And they've done, it looks like they've done a lot of work to ensure that it is a fully balanced game. Um, and even then, it probably doesn't take too much modulation. What I'm hearing on the internet from those who have tried it yeah. is that it's the, it's the best game mode yes. that they've ever come up with. Yep. Um, the rule set's too clean. I'm excited for it. Um, so it's uh, we're on the horizon of some major things as the, uh, well, 3.0 starts to fade. Um, yeah. In fact, you know, the next time you hear us, the next time we record, we will have our pre-orders in for AOS 4.0. Oh, yeah. So it's just going to be, oh, it's, we're going to have so much fun. <laughs> Oops, all rats. Yeah, I'm telling you what, <laughs> Stormcast going to beat rat face. Maybe. <laughs> well, again, like the spearhead's supposed to be balanced. So, I mean, I yeah. think those will be fun games. I really, um, I do. I think it's going to be really, and the spearheads are going to be great ways to figure out the tactics for your army yep. without having to have made this impossibly huge monetary uh, commitment to it. And, you know, I trust, I believe, I'm I'm not even cautiously optimistic anymore. I'm just looking forward to this flat yeah. out. It's going to be good. Agreed. So, And I'm uh, I'm definitely going to see if someone will trade me the Stormcast version, or the Stormcast half for a uh, rat half, so so I can have two rats. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hook you up there. <laughs> not a worry. You're like, I will take all those beautiful Stormcast off your hand. Yeah. I mean, that'll get you, what, two units of Liberators now, or a full? Mm-hmm. Uh, two units of the new... Ruination BAs, yeah. God, those models are so. Oh. But I'm I'm never gonna play Stormcast. So ever I, uh, really? No, it's not my thing, man. I've tried so many times and it just never pops off for me. Yep. Um, it's just not a. Th- I mean, I like some of their models a lot. If anything, I would use their models uh, to make uh, custodies. Yeah. Yeah. All the female models, of course. Yeah. Only. <laughs> 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 All right, folks. That was the uh, tripartite. Prep yourself up for 4.0 about to launch uh, lore section. A um, bit of a quicker one today, but I think that it's just hard when you're at the end of an edition to yeah. to get to it. But definitely go listen to Doug um, yeah. about uh, the last book of Harbingers. Yes. Get your hobby supplies ready, right? Yep. Gird and your if you, loins. If you have any hobby tips that you think should be shared, throw them up on the Discord and we'll talk about them next time. Yeah, I'll make a... I'll make a form that's called just the tips. So <laughs> I like it. Just the tip. <laughs> All right. All right, folks. So that does it for today. Get ready for after dark where Bill and I will be extra punchy today. The music in the show is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com and is used under the creative commons license. The rolling bad podcast itself is protected under the creative commons attribution 4.0 international license. Information for this license can be found at creativecommons.org.